All right. Hello. Hello. Welcome back to another uh, episode of Results Not Typical. Uh, so just a couple quick things that I wanted to bring your attention to. Uh, so depending on when you're listening to this particular interview on November 23rd uh, at what would be 4 p.m. PST, I'm going to be teaching a live virtual restorative Pilates class. So it'll be a lot of feel good, roll around on the ground, reduce tension, reduce stress kind of stuff, a little bit of core strength maybe. Uh, and it's totally free. So if you want to get in on that and the replay, the sign up link for that is in the show notes if you're listening to this, or it's in the description if you're watching this interview on YouTube. Other thing I want to give you a heads up is that a few of you have asked me when uh, Kettlebells Made Simple is coming back, or you've asked me if I offer any uh, strength training for beginner programs. So the answer is yes. Isabel, who co-teaches this with me and I, are bringing it back. It's going to kick off again January 23rd of 2022. However, we know that a lot of y'all like to plan ahead. So uh, we are offering a $50 discount if you sign up before December 25th of this year, 2021. Um, this program is great if you are a super beginner to strength and kettlebells and you want a way to get strong um, and learn how to strength train at home. We will have ample options for folks who have have, let's say a pain of, um, or history, sorry, a history of pain or injury, uh, or if you have some considerations because you're hypermobile. So if you want more information on that, again, the link is in the show notes and the sign up link is also in the YouTube description, or you can go to kettlebellsmadesimple.com to get that information. All right. With that, uh, let's get into this interview with Steph and Robin on strength training and women. It's a really good one. So I hope you enjoy it. This is Nikki Nablevi, and you are listening to Results Not Typical, a podcast that challenges the traditional narrative of Pilates and fitness while tackling misinformation that is keeping you from reaching your fitness goals. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Results Not Typical. Today, we are going to talk about some of the barriers of entry to strength training and why strength training is really valuable for longevity, particularly for women as we get older. And if you haven't considered it, um, we're going to talk about maybe why you might want to, and also maybe create some parameters around what it means to strength train or pursue strength, because I see that word thrown around a lot. And a lot of the time, I'm not sure that it means what we think it means, or we think we're doing it, but we're not necessarily doing it in a way that the research would support certain benefits such as bone density. So that's kind of top of mind for me. I've got Robin Leggett and Steph Godreau with me today. And uh, welcome ladies. Thanks for being here to have this conversation. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, so just so we don't talk over each other, I do want to give you each a moment to introduce yourselves in case anyone who's listening isn't familiar with your work. So uh, Robin, why don't you kick us off? Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Robin Leggett. Uh, I am San Diego based currently, and I am an online fitness coach. And I call myself an athletic aging coach. It's a, it's a word I made up. Active aging is a really common phrase, but I kind of want to take it to the next level. Active is great. Athletic is awesome. So um, I help women over 40 explore their athletic potential, whatever that looks like for them, because I know the word athlete and athletic, um, some people don't connect with it right off the bat. They may not see themselves in a, as an athlete. I like to help women, especially aging women, see that in themselves in a way that makes sense for them so that they can experience the wide ranging and life changing benefits that come when you tap into that side of yourself and you you discover your ability to do things you didn't think you could do and look at fitness and exercise from that lens, as opposed to a weight loss lens, a shrinking lens, a lens that maybe you've been conditioned to think that's what fitness is for period. I like to help. Um, I like to help women shift their thinking and their mindset around that so that they can truly see what's possible with them, for themselves. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Mic drop. Steph, I'm, jump I'm done. I'm done. Bye. <laughs> I'm a strength. I call myself a strength nutrition strategist and coach as I'm really looking at how do we fuel ourselves properly? If we want to get stronger, we're, you know, much like Robin was talking about, we're active or athletic and I'm also a strength coach. So what I really help women who lift weights do is fuel themselves properly. Again, we've been conditioned. There's so much misinformation out there about what that actually looks like. 
you know, how do we fuel our bodies properly so that we build muscle, we get stronger, we get results from the efforts that we're putting in. Uh, we have more energy instead of less, and we're able to perform better in and out of the gym in the rest of our lives, whatever that looks like. So I've been doing this online for a very long time and have seen lots of things come and go. And now that I am also over 40, I'm, I'm sort of shocked and bewildered by some of the things that I see really marketed toward women in this decade and beyond. And so I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Yeah, it's the information out there is staggering. And I want to say that as we dive into this, if you are someone who uh, has pursued some of these things, we're not here to mock or judge you. That's not what this is about. This is simply about having a conversation around why women deserve access to better education and better information, because it is it's really confusing. It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. And there's some people who can sound very smart and authoritative and still be just things that they're saying don't actually make sense and are completely unfounded. So I let's maybe kick this off here with this. When we all talk about strength training and strength, what do we mean by that? Because I don't know if you've had this experience on your Instagram, Robin, but I know Steph and I have had some, some interesting conversations where we're like, yeah, you probably need more than a two pound pink dumbbell. And people are sometimes deeply committed to defending the two pound pink dumbbells is the way I would put it where they're like, well, I do these things with these two pound pink dumbbells and I really like it and don't say that it's bad. And I don't think that any of us are saying that exercise modalities that maybe you know, focus on stability or want to use two pound pink dumbbells are bad. But if your goal for strength training is to prevent or stave off sarcopenia, which is muscle loss or promote better bone density or stave off bone loss as you get older, which is really important for women, especially as we get older, you're not going to accomplish that with a two pound pink dumbbell. And I think that that's where we can dive into talking about what do we mean when we say strength training? Because I think putting that in a container is really important for this conversation. Well, who wants to begin with that? Um, <laughs> I, I can start. Um, so I think what, and there's a lack of education, which thankfully is changing. I think it, what I've noticed is it is starting to change. You know, Steph and I are, are doing it, but I'm seeing other sources as well. So thankfully it's starting to happen, but there's a long way to go. But um, as you mentioned, Nikki, you know, women lose muscle as we get older. It starts in our 30s. It multiplies as we enter perimenopause and menopause. This is what what the lack of education is, is that estrogen plays a strong role in muscle development. So when we start to lose that, we need to make up for it in some way. And it's different for everybody. When perimenopause hits, it's different for everybody. What the symptoms are are different for everybody, but the muscle loss is pretty standard. The bone loss is pretty standard. And you need to create a certain level of neuromuscular stimulus which I know is a you know 50 cent word, but that basically means a brain body connection. You need to stimulate that to promote actual muscle growth. And the two pound pink dumbbells, as much as we love them, are not going to do that. You may feel like you're, you know, you're getting sore, especially when you're doing things like bar work where those two pound pink dumbbells actually will do something because you're doing those like little tiny movements. And so, and a lot of women are drawn to workouts like that because you get sore. I've done a bar workout and I couldn't sit on the toilet, like with a two pound pink dumbbell, like I've done that. Um, but that's, it's not actually stimulating muscle growth in the way that your body needs to prevent muscle loss at a bare minimum and build bubble if that is something you are looking to do, which Steph and I love to help women do, is actually step into your strength. So um, it really comes to, I think, first and foremost, education and understanding what's happening with your body as you age, which, you know, there's a lot of confusion around perimenopause and menopause. And um, what I see on, on the groups is, you know, a lot of confusion around the symptoms and a lot of it ends up becoming a new level of self-loathing because these things are happening. Like I've got a belly when I ha didn't have one before and fat in places I didn't have it before and I can't seem to get rid of it and I don't know what to do with it and I hate it and they're, they're getting depressed. And, and so you get lost in that 
And that, you know, that's challenging. And so for Steph and I, and for you, Nikki, it's sort of our job to step in and empower women with education around what, what to actually do to circumvent this, to combat this, to not fall prey to it. Um, and so, you know, I think I've given sort of a roundabout answer around, you know, what it means to grow muscle, what you need to do and why the two, two pound pink dumbbells, um, are not doing it. Right. I think that's, I think that's a really important piece of it. Steph, I might hand this next piece to you, which is let's discuss about what you do have to do. Because on the flip side, I think people sort of think, well, it's, it's, it's bar with a two pound pink dumbbell. And then sometimes we say strength training and they go, well, I don't want to do an hour of burpees. And I'm like, also mm-hmm. not what I meant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's such a great question. And and again, to your point about the, the tiny pink, I had a post about tiny pink dumbbells and some people came for me and I was like, look, you know, first of all, if you're lifting your purse, your backpack, your child, cat litter, a dog food bag, whatever it happens to be in your daily life, you're probably lifting more than two pounds. You might not be doing 50 reps of that thing as if you would in say, for example, like a a class such as bar where you're doing tons and tons of repetitions and, and sort of overloading the muscle in that way. And it does, it makes you feel tired and exhausted and like you did something and that's all well and good. And, and I am not here to knock those other forms of exercise in the least. So here's the thing we need to understand that there are there are exercise guidelines for adults. And that equates to something like two or more muscle strengthening exercise sessions a week, um, two to start at least, and 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular aerobic exercise, or 75 minutes of vigorous cardiovascular exercise or combination of the two. So we need both of those components. And when we look out at what's very popular, we do see things that are not necessarily in the, in the real muscle strengthening category that actually are more in that cardiovascular aerobic zone. So for example, Peloton, extremely popular now. I mean, I, I don't want to put my, my butt on a bike seat for any time soon. Cause I used to race bikes for a really long time, but I get it. It's popular. There's community. There's an app. It's really engaging. And so nobody is saying, don't do those exercises, but we have to be honest about, and we have to say, this is well studied by exercise science, by physiologists. We have papers to back these things up is like truly building strength and strength is the ability of your muscle to exert a force on a weight or, or on some other kind of object. We need to be able to work in sort of zones that support that strength building. So for example, um, if you are going to try to build strength so that you can increase that force production of the muscle, and then also by extension, have your bone strengthen, right? Cause we need that sort of torsion in, in, in real like torque and exertion on the, on the bone as well to build bone, bone mineral density. What we really need to see is that we're doing the, we're doing a quote unquote appropriate for you, heavy enough lift such that you're getting the stimulus, much like Robin was talking about that neuromuscular kind of connection. And so we need to be able to get that stimulus to occur um, and also to be able to engage both those type one and type two fibers, which people might kind of know colloquially as fast twitch and slow twitch. Um, And we need a certain amount of force to be able to do that. So here's the thing, doing 15 or 20 or 30 reps of something is not bad, but we also need those lower repetition, higher weight or higher load stimulus. And it has to be where those last couple reps are a challenge. So if I'm lifting a two pound dumbbell and I'm doing it five times and I feel nothing, that's not giving me the strength benefit. So I hope that answers the the question. Um, but I feel like there's, there has to be an honest conversation about things like progressive overload. If you start lighter for whatever reason, because that's where you're at, or you start with a different version of an exercise that's requiring, for example, less flexibility or mobility in your upper body and you're focusing more on your lower body, like whatever that happens to be, that's fine. But how are you going to move that forward? And because your body adapts over time, we need to continue to change that stimulus in a smart way. It doesn't have to be every workout where we're like confusing our body, but it has to be done in a thoughtful, 
um, progressed way so that you actually continue to adapt and get that benefit. Yes. And, and I think that another thing that you brought up in that stuff that I think is really important, um, that also Robin, you brought up was that there's workouts that can be designed to make you feel sore and tired, but that is very different than using a moderate to heavy weight for a smaller number of reps of major muscle groups. Like let's just say ballpark five to 12, even 15, if you like the high rep thing for like a couple rounds, that's going to, even if that doesn't make you as sore, because the mechanisms for soreness are different than the mechanisms for muscle growth, for strength, for creating the positive hormone cascade that we want for things like muscle and bone density, all of that stuff, they're not the same. And so this is, this goes to this idea of sensation is not, <laughs> sorry, everyone, that is my dog and husband in the background. I knew this was but this is very different than like sensation isn't the same thing as results. And what this brings my brain to is like, well, you're like, well, if the workout isn't what's making me have all the muscle, like, like, you know, like if, if it's not the soreness, that's like doing it for me, that's like going to create these results Then what's happening. And I think this is where we need to have the more nuanced conversation about how you need the appropriate stimulus or dosage of strength training, but you also need to pair that with certain nutritional things to support it and things like appropriate rest, recovery, and sleep. So do we want to maybe talk about how those pieces play a part in it? Because I think sometimes people think that they need to do more and they actually need to do less physical activity, but the right amounts of physical activity with more of this other stuff that's more daily boring habit change type things. Oh, I love daily boring habit change. That's like my favorite thing. Um, you know, it's I kind of going back to a little bit of I want to go back to a little bit of what Steph said because I think, you know, the biggest thing we can do is help educate women. And, you know, she was talking about rep ranges. I want to start there. She was talking about rep ranges, and it's like there's the high rep with the, the lighter weights or the lower rep with the heavier weights. And it made me think it's like, she and I were trained as, as fitness professionals where we learned what rep ranges mean. And they taught us in, in our education as fitness professionals that zero to six reps at a heavy weight that you can only manage for that number of reps will help build strength. You get a moderate range and you're building muscle size and you do the high reps with the low uh, light weight and it's muscle endurance. And nobody teaches everybody else that. Like we need to teach everybody else that because that's important if you understand what these rep ranges do for you. And so, and with those high, uh, with those um, low rep heavy weight, an important component of that is rest in between sets. Never mind the rest outside of your workouts, but people, and I think women in particular, are trained to believe that a workout should make you feel exhausted, that you should be moving, moving, moving the entire time so that you're tired and you're sore and you feel like you've got a good workout. But if you're being intentional and thoughtful about your workout and you're actually working to build strength, rest is included in there. You don't want to be working to exhaustion. You won't be able to do the reps in the next set if you are not resting in between sets. And there's ways to superset where you're doing a lower body set and then you move on to an upper body set where you can minimize that rest time in between. But but it's about understanding and really, you know, helping women gain knowledge around that so they know the purpose of what they're doing. And then when it comes to outside of your workouts, getting that proper rest and recovering, getting that proper sleep, that is actually where the magic happens. You are, you know, you're fatiguing your muscles in the workouts. And then when you recover, and especially when you sleep, that's when your body is actually making itself stronger. And so it's really important. And I know it's hard for many women to do with busy lives to prioritize rest, to prioritize recovery, to prioritize sleep. But that is super important. It's a super important component of this whole thing. And, and nutrition is a major component as well. I'm going to pass that to Steph because she is a strength nutrition coach. So she can really get into the nitty gritty on that. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Thanks, Robin. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we're like newscasters. Like, yeah. <laughs> over yeah, to please. you, Steph. Over to me. Um, so one thing I want to just piggyback on really quickly and kind of emphasize that you said is this, this idea, for example, understanding um, 
you know, those, those different ranges of, for example, repetitions with what it actually does, what does the stimulus do and the rest periods. And here's the thing. I used to be a high school science teacher. So maybe I'm a little bit partial to this, but we have some really basic fundamental ideas like regenerating our body's energy molecule called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. And every time I talk about, well, do you know why you have to rest? If you're doing a heavy set of five, why do you need to rest an appropriate amount of time, which could be anywhere from two to five minutes between sets? Why do we do that? It's because your body actually has to have time to regenerate that ATP. It's like plugging in a rechargeable battery for a very short period of time. And when we talk about that, it's sort of like, oh, okay, I understand. So I think that the industry, and this is just a little bit of my soapbox, but I think the industry does a really terrible job of sort of treating women like we're stupid. And does everyone need to understand uh, or have a degree in biochemistry or human physiology? No, but at the same time, we're smart. Women deserve better information and, and the rationale and actually adult learners do better when they understand the why behind something. So this is kind of my, my bone to pick with some of the other professionals out there is like, give us a little bit of the why maybe you don't need to go into the hormonal cascades or, you know, the, the different biochem, but give us a little nugget so that we understand. Cause when we understand the why we're better able to apply it. Um, so again, you know, talking about things like recovery, uh, and nutrition, I mean, I think we live in a world where we kind of have two polar opposites here, especially in the nutrition space when it comes to strength training or athletes. We all believe that it has to be your tracking, your tracking, weighing, logging, and measuring every single thing you eat. Um, it is something you have to be obsessive about. You have to walk around with my fitness pal and a food scale. And I kind of reject that notion because I think for most people who are athletic, even if they're not competing, you, you're going to go, you're going to get a lot of mileage out of some really basic nutrition foundations and fundamentals. The first thing people want to ask me is Steph, which supplements should I be taking? Should I take creatine? Should I do a post-workout? Should I do this? Should I do that? And so, and my, my question back is how chaotic are your meals? <laughs> or how consistent are your meals? Are you an erratic eater? And, and oftentimes the answer is yes. And so that is not something that we're going to solve with supplements, right? That's something that we need to take a look at again, those habits, those foundations. So things like, are you eating consistent meals during the day? Three to four times a day, are you putting food in your, in your pie hole? And is it, you know, roughly kind of a, a balanced plate of, of things like proteins and vegetables and maybe some carbs and a little bit of fat. Like let's, let's, we, we make it boring and basic because that's the stuff that works, you know? Um, and, and looking at those things as like a foundation. So we need that foundation of energy. That's really, really important. And because of the pervasiveness of, uh, high, let's just call it high caloric deficit plans where it's like, we all need to cut 500 calories off of our, our food intake <laughs> because of the pervasive, pervasive, pervasiveness of that, because of things like the fear of fat and fat gain and fat phobia. And I mean, it's so multifaceted, but women walk into this space, oftentimes under eating underfed, they wonder why they are trying really hard and they don't feel well. And it's because we don't have enough energy because we need energy to run our basic bodily functions. We need energy to support our movement outside of exercise. So I'm like wildly gesticulating as I'm talking that requires energy. For example, we need energy to digest our food and we need energy for purposeful exercise, all of those things. So I think that's a, a big chunk. And then I'm always on my horse about protein intake. Um, I think this is so important and, and just to kind of riff on this a little bit for muscle recovery, right? Muscle recovery doesn't just take place in the 30 minutes after our workout. It's on a continuum. People always talk about the 30 minute window. Here's my thing. Don't, don't eat like a jerk and skip all your meals after your workout, but also don't, you don't have to freak out about getting the exact right proportions, you know, in 15 minutes after you train, but you have to be smart as well. And we need the amino acids in protein, specifically the three branch chain amino acids, specifically, specifically leucine is the most important of those three. So leucine, valine, and isoleucine, we need that to trigger a 
a process in our body called muscle protein synthesis. We need to be able to make and recover our muscle tissue because when we lift, especially we are incurring small micro damage to those tissues and how we get stronger and how we build muscle volume is by that recovery process. We stress the muscle, we recover, we get the adaptation. And so we need to also, like Robin was saying, we need to support that with rest and in and, and actual recovery and sleep and also the nutritional piece that goes along with that. Yes. And I think what's so interesting about this is like, we dropped some different, we dropped some science here and there, which hopefully a lot of y'all who listen, I know are kind of nerds like I am. So you appreciate knowing the why. Um, I love conversations where we get to talk about the why. Uh, but also what I want you to, what I, if you're listening, what I'd like you to start thinking about, whether it's for yourself or your clients is noticing how there are actions that you can take. Um, but a lot of the time, the actions that get sold to us um, as women of what we should take are really complicated, really time consuming, um, ineffective. And also, even if they were effective, but spoiler alert, they're not for the aforementioned reasons. Um, they're really unsustainable, right? I think it's really unsustainable to be constantly working out seven days a week, as hard as you can to be as sore as you can. I think it's really unsustainable to be logging, weighing, measuring, obsessing over all of your food and being in a chronic caloric deficit. And then wondering why, if you're working as hard as you can, and you're making yourself as tired as you can all the time on top of normal life stress, and you're not eating, of course, we're going to feel terrible. And then also there's some really gnarly symptoms that go with menopause and perimenopause. And so it's like, I just feel like sometimes it's, it's sort of like, yeah, let's just throw oil on top of this dumpster fire at that point, when you throw that into the mix. And I think that is what puts us in a place to be really vulnerable and then start to feel really desperate and then get really obsessed with weight loss. And so I would sort of love to know your gals' takes on maybe talking about, well, if I'm not focusing on weight loss, what's the point? What should I focus on? And maybe why, you know, again, anyone who listens to me knows I'm very goal agnostic. So I'm like, do what you want with your body. You want to do a caloric deficit. You want to pursue weight loss. That's fine. But I think it's worth talking about why we should look at fitness and nutrition through a lens of sustainability and long-term health and tracking other things instead of being obsessed with this idea of weight loss or um, aesthetic goals within fitness. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of directions I can go on this. Um, and especially for women who are aging, who are in perimenopause, menopause, but <clears throat> excuse me, women throughout our lifetime are, are just conditioned to think weight loss is the only reason to exercise. I think, and that's not all women, of course, but like as a whole, my experience is that that, that is what we're told that we are meant to be small that we are meant to nitpick our bodies, like even like, oh, my flabby tricep, like just really nitpicking, right? And, and the problem with that is that it's a demoralizing, it can be a demoralizing way to approach your own health. If the results are not going the way you want them to go. And of course, in your own mind, you may view your body differently than it may actually be. There's a lot of dysmorphia that happens in that. Um, where you just, it, it gets demoralizing and then you just stop. And so there's a lot of like all in all out mentality, as you mentioned, Nikki, that women can fall prey to where it's like, okay, for the, you know, right now I'm joining this challenge or I'm just going to go all in, I'm going to count and measure and work out seven days a week. And I'm, I'm looking how great I'm doing. Look at, look at the body changes that are happening. But like, as you said, it's not sustainable. So what happens when that's over? What happens when you can't do that anymore? And so it's this yo-yo situation that that kind of creates a self self-loathing. It's not very empowering. And so that's why I like to help women look at things differently. I I have discovered my own athletic ability later in life, and this is my own, own personal journey. But but it's worth mentioning that you know I fell into an athletic lifestyle when I joined a roller derby league in my 30s as a way to make friends. I never meant to be an athlete in my life. I never viewed myself as an athlete. I would never have used that word. But then when I started doing this thing, I started discovering my own ability to learn skills I didn't think I could learn, do things I didn't think I could do, be a badass, which I never saw myself being. And that lit me up to keep doing it. 
you know, and, and that started a fitness journey back when I was 29 years old that has not stopped and I am 46. Um, and so that's it. I love helping women see that where we can move away from this weighing and measuring and, and nitpicking point of view that leads you to this like all or nothing mentality. I've got to be extreme or nothing to training, to be able to do things that you didn't think you could do and following a structured training plan that accounts for rest that accounts for recovery. That is thoughtful because that's how you train for sport. Um, and, and actually ends up simplifying everything. And that's really kind of the point I'm leading to here is that we have this tendency to overcomplicate because we are stuck in these patterns of wanting to change our bodies, wanting to have aesthetic goals, being demoralized by those goals, quitting, and then getting back into it. Um, instead, simplifying everything and following these basic basic tenants that, you know, you lift weights, you get strong, you have a certain amount of cardio that supports what you're trying to achieve. You are fueling your body appropriately, understanding the food you eat instead of, you know, hacking it. Um, having recovery days built into your program and following it and getting appropriate rest, sort of the big five is what I call it. And the more you can simplify that stuff and really take a more simplistic point of view, the easier it gets to adhere to it. And especially when you have a goal that that lights you up, that you are excited about, that you can see the progress along the way that, you know, I, for example, I do obstacle races. That's my current sport, Spartan races and things like that. And for a while I was running a gym in Santa Monica where we would train people to do obstacle races. And the people that came to my gym didn't necessarily come to me to run obstacle races, but it's like, this is the workout we're doing here. Let's learn how to do monkey bars. And I would teach them how to get across monkey bars, something they hadn't done since they were five years old. And these were women in their, <clears throat> excuse me, late thirties, early forties. And to see them cross those monkey bars for the first time in like 20 years lit them up. Like I could see a change in their face. I could see a change in their demeanor and they wanted to keep doing it. Like they wanted to do more. And so I love, I love kind of that, that point of view, like what can I do more of how, what can I become? How can I expand as a person as, as opposed to how can I shrink? How can I be less? How can I be smaller? And so sometimes it's a mindset shift. But when you can kind of move into that space, it can change the whole thing for you. And so um, did I answer your question? I'm not sure, but <laughs> I got all my soapbox. <laughs> I think I think soapboxes are welcome here. Let's put it that way. I don't think there's a wrong answer. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think you put out, I think there's some really salient points in there uh, talking about giving what you're doing relevancy to the thing to support the things that you want to be doing where it's like i'm not saying you have to ride or die by strength training but i know that we all sort of pursue other activities outside of strength i don't think any of us live for the gym like i don't mind the gym but i don't live i don't want to like live there 24 7 right but it's like being able to support things like if you enjoy running if you enjoy obstacle racing if you want to be able to hike and garden without back pain i don't really care what your other thing is because it's going to be really really individual but I think it's this idea of sort of focusing, again, not in like a PR kind of way, but like a how can this support me in my life kind of way and help me feel like I can be empowered to do things instead of let me turn myself into like a lawn ornament where my only purpose is to like pose. It's like, no, you're not a lawn gnome. You like you can or, you know, a trina doll or whatever. Like you can you can aspire to use your body to do things to assist you in your life instead of this idea that you're supposed to sit on a shelf and not actually move. Because I think that's the other thing that's so ridiculous about these aesthetic conversations is we basically dehumanize ourselves where we, we, we turn ourselves into like these little objects instead of being like, wow, I have a really full, busy, hectic, stressful life where lots of people rely on me. And I think that's the greater reality. And how can I support myself in these things? So that's, that's my take. Steph, any thoughts you have? Yeah. I think anybody whose interest is piqued by this particular topic should uh, consider going to look at the research uh, about self-objectification and uh, beauty redefined is, is one uh, company that's talking about this a lot. So it's self-objectification is essentially how we view ourselves as through the lens of other people. The way I would describe it in a sort of a common term might be self-consciousness. 
And so this stuff can go pretty deep. And again, the pressures on, especially women to at every phase of life, look a certain way, have a certain body, uh, rebound from having a baby. If that's something that has happened in your life, um, you know, look a certain way going into perimenopause and your body is changing. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. The amount of things that we are under the pressure to do the look, the part, and then we have beauty standards and we have body standards and that's a huge problem. Those are huge problems in and of themselves. I think the thing is that our bodies are always going to be changing. And so if we're constantly changing a specific aesthetic, first of all, if you're in the industry and you're like, do this program, cause you're going to look like me at the end or eat this way. Cause you'll look like me. You're selling, uh, you're selling a lie because bodies are very diverse. We could all do the same program and actually eat in the same way. We might get stronger. Relatively speaking, we might gain muscle relatively speaking, but we're not going to look the same. So anyone selling that you're going to look a specific way because you do X, Y, Z workout or eat in X, Y, Z way is, you know, I don't know what their intentions are, but that's not the way things work. And that's not what, what people want to hear, frankly. And so we have to be kind of honest with ourselves and say, you might not look like that, that influencer that you follow that does booty bands because they're 23 and you're 45 and your lives are very different and your bodies are different and you have different genetics and different circumstances. And so there's that, right? Um, again, your body is changing. So if you're always just ch chasing some specific aesthetic goal, where is the, you're never going to be satisfied. Where does it end? It does not end. You will never be happy. You will never be satisfied with what you have. You're always going to you'll hit that goal and you'll say, well, what else? How much more? You know, uh, for me, it was chasing the scale number. I got to that lowest scale number because I wasn't eating very much uh, relative to my training. This is many, many years ago. I finally saw the number on the scale and I was happy for about three seconds. And then my next question to myself was, how much more can I, can I lose? That was, you know, we, we're, we're, we're not going to be happy when we're constantly chasing the body stuff, the aesthetics, specific aesthetics, because the body is always changing. And, and so yes, having something else that you can focus on or something else that you can identify with. One of my most popular reels that I've ever done was, was me going around my house and mimicking the major movement patterns as they applied to my real life. So squatting with a, with a goblet squat, for example, I was, I sat down to a low cushion on the floor or pressing a, a kettlebell overhead. I put something on top of my refrigerator. <laughs> and I think, you know, we have to think about how are we moving through daily life for most, for, a, I won't say most people, for a lot of people maintaining things like their independence and their ability to move freely through their lives in their current bodies is really important. And, and it's maybe not the sexiest goal, but if we're, if we have better emotion through our lives, because yes, we're not spending 24 hours in the gym. We're maybe spending an hour in the gym a, a few times a week. We're living our lives the rest of the time. So can we get better at moving through our lives? How does getting stronger benefit you toward your values? So for example, a, a few of my clients have a very strong sense of adventure. They love to go out, explore new places, you know, the whole nine yards. And so for them, they identify the pursuit of strength training as allowing them to participate more fully in their values of adventure or family or creativity or whatever it is. So I think those are kind of the, the points that I would just add on is like, our bodies are always changing. We're under a lot of pressure to adhere to a specific ideal that does not exist and it's not realistic. And also being able to address how, how does moving benefit my daily life strength? How does strength benefit my daily life? And how does it actually work in with my values? That's much more long-term sustainable than going like, I want to have a booty that looks like this person on Instagram. Yeah. Which I frankly think is like a very quick descent into madness. Um, right. And, and again, there's, I have no judgment. Like I, I think we've all ended up in some sort of mental trap because we're just conditioned to feel that way. And it's just force fed to us. Like you can't, 
You can't, you can't open up your phone. You can't turn on, like, it's just, it's, it's in a, it's in everything in our culture. Like it's just steeped into our culture. And so I think that's why it's so important that we start having conversations of offering an alternative narrative that you can sort of start to play with and, and sort of know that like, okay, this part of me might exist within me and exist within our culture. But I think starting to like, when those thoughts pop into our head, being able to be like, is this really self-serving? Is this really going to work? Like, I, I feel like at this point, most of us are old enough to be like, we've been there and done that. And this is clearly not working for me. And so, I mean, I think that's the other thing is if you're listening and if you're 1200 calorie diet and you're, you know, 14 hours of exercise a week are working for you and you're happy, like go forth and prosper. Like, I don't care what other people do with their bodies. But at the same time, what I see is, is that that's usually not working for people. And if it's working for them, it's working for them in the span of 14 days. And then the rest of the year, they're really tired and exhausted and feeling terrible about themselves until they find 14 more days on January 2nd, 2020, 2022 to do it again. So that's the thing about sustainability. I think that we really do need to sort of step back and look at long-term. And I think we could, we could go on these topics forever and ever. So I think where I'm going to lead us in sort of the final thread, and then I'll give you each sort of an opportunity to talk about where people can find you, including your podcast and all of that. Um, for people who they want to get started with strength, and at the very least, we've now covered that, no, you don't have to do burpees. And yes, I'm so very sorry, you have to use more than a two pound dumbbell. That's just simply the reality, right? Uh, and they want to sort of have like an alter, like they're like, okay, how do I get started with strength? Where do I look? Okay, where where can I start investigating something that's not a 1200 calorie diet? Like, where are some really basic places that people can start? Um, and again, both of you offer great resources and services around this too, I know, but I think sort of giving guidelines on how to assess, like, is this a good idea that's kind of science or evidence-based? And is this another fad? I think it's a good place to kind of maybe have that conversation for a moment. I was trying to unmute. I couldn't do it. <laughs> My mouse wasn't working. Um, I, I think it really comes down to like, try to simplify as much as possible. And, and like, you know, the trend is look for the red flags. Like it's an Instagram trend right now, but like, watch out for the red flags that, that seem convoluted. If they seem convoluted, they probably are. Or, um, you know, and a big red flag is anything that preys on your insecurity, anything that's like, you should do this because it will fix this thing you're insecure about. That's never a good place to start from. That's never a thing that's going to, that's going to lead to like lasting motivation to keep going. So um, avoiding that, but really just like getting down to the basics. Like, like you mentioned, you don't have to work out for hours and hours every day. You can work out for 15, 20 minutes. Like you can use the time you have available and do some basic movement patterns. Uh, I know Steph is a big plan, a big fan of, of the basic movement patterns, squat, lunge, hinge, which is bending at the waist, um, twist. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to forget uh, gait, which is just like move locomotion and movement, heavy carries, just carrying things. You know, Steph mentioned all the regular everyday things in life that that strength training helps you do. It reminded me my car is in the shop and I have to walk to the grocery store right now. And so I, the other day I was carrying like six bags home from the grocery store walking. And I love that I can do that. And strength training makes it possible for me to do that. So reminding yourself of all the everyday benefits and thinking about these movements that you're doing. Um, and you can do this for, you know, 15, 20 minutes to start. And that might be a lot for you. That might make you tired. But think about if you're doing this on your own, I love using rate of perceived exertion as a sort of guide. You can self-assess if a weight is heavy enough for you. If you're doing six reps of an exercise and you, you're, you have a weight and you're not tired at all, and you would rate, if you could rate on a scale of one to 10, how, how hard that was for you, and you're rating it at like a three or four, you probably need heavier weights. So I always like to encourage my clients, because I have online clients and they have to self-assess as well. And so I tell them like, you want to be kind of, you know, seven to nine with that. And if you're not there, you may want to think about getting heavier weights. So you can, you can empower yourself to self-assess your own workouts and determine when you need to go heavier. 
Um, and then when it comes down to nutrition, like I love helping my clients just understand how to read a nutrition label, just know what's in there because there's a lot of deception in there, particularly in regards to sugar, as an example, where you think, oh, this is a low sugar food, but it's like your one serving is like three servings on the label. So it's, you know, your, your five grams is really 15. So, you know, we're not getting into weighing and measuring, but just knowing just understanding what you're eating, what's in your food, filling your plate with protein, vegetables, carbs, having breakfast in the morning. Like if that's something you're not doing, like just doing some basic changes, one change at a time is great. Um, And that's really a fundamental thing about habit change is like, don't try to change everything all at once. Maybe your change is working out for 15 minutes a day. And that's the one thing you focus on right now. That's great. Maybe your one change is I'm going to eat breakfast in the morning. I'm going to start doing that every day. Focus on one thing at a time. Keep it simple for yourself. Don't try to do massive overhauls because they never work. It's too much. We are meant to kind of pick up one thing at a time. If it's not working, what can you what can you tweak? What can you adjust? Give yourself grace if you miss a day of a workout, if you miss a day of breakfast, if you give yourself grace, that's okay. Try it again the next day. It doesn't mean it's all over. So just like really pulling back, simplifying as much as possible. And then arming yourself with knowledge, letting yourself have the, the, be empowered with the knowledge to make decisions around your fitness and not falling prey to the gimmicks, to the schemes, to the hormone balancing coaches, to the diet plans, um, but just making really simple, basic d- decisions around your, your habits. And I like to not call it healthy habits. I like to call it happy habits. Because like, the, the things that you do, do they serve you? Do they make you feel good in a long-term kind of way? How can you introduce more of those into your life in a way that is simple, doable, sustainable, one at a time? I love those. <laughs> um, I would... <laughs> I would just say, I mean, gosh, so much stuff that I would also echo there, but you know, when you're out in the world, you have hmm, the sexier and more alluring something seems generally speaking, the more, the higher it is on the BS meter. If you, if you really take a look and I mean, I hate to say this, but it's the stuff that works is the stuff that everybody kind of knows already. You know, uh, it's like eating, eating, uh, fruits and vegetables and putting some protein on your plate and staying hydrated and, and stuff like that. It, when you see those Instagram posts and they do not, those types of Instagram posts typically do not do well because they are not the most flashy, the things that are the most flashy or outrageous or the most arguable are the things that people are drawn to because of the algorithm. Like, let's just be honest. The stuff that's the basics doesn't, doesn't generally do very well because people are like, Oh, scroll, you know, this is boring. Does this stuff doesn't work. So I would just say, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If someone's promising the one superfood that's going to cure everything and magically make you shed tons of weight, um, you know, <laughs> I know it's so tough. You're like, just that one thing. It could be so easy. Don't fall prey to that, to that sort of siren song of, of the over promises and, and the flashiness. Um, you know, look for people that do talk about evidence-based or science-based stuff. And I know that's hard sometimes to do, to look for that stuff, but it's out there. People are talking about this. There are people who as part of their, their education and, and part of their certifications and part of their professional associations have to maintain a a knowledge of what's going on in the, in the literature. And, and so looking for people that talk about those things, or at least point you to where you could find out more. I mean, it, no one, uh, no one wants to think, oh, I'm going to read this Instagram post and then I have to go read a paper. And that's not the point, but it's just looking for those, those solid basics of information and, um, and staying away from the flash, I guess. The other thing I would say is, is sort of when you're considering changes to make is I'm a huge fan of the ad first mentality, which is, um, you know, most dietary changes are all about what you have to remove a big list of no foods, a big list of things to cut out like entire macronutrients. I mean, let's just be real here, cutting out all your carbohydrates, unless you're on a medically supervised 
nutrition plan or medical nutrition therapy through a doctor, like is probably, you know, a, it's not going to be sustainable and B you're what's the purpose? What's the point? Uh, is this necessary? And, and the reality is, is that this has to be something you can do for the rest of your life. Can you do this for the rest of your life? Probably not. So let's look at things like, how can I p- potentially do something like add a little bit, more, you know, add an extra serving of vegetables. Can I add a little bit more protein to my plate? Can I include a, a probiotic rich food on, on, uh, in my routine? These are all simple things that you can add one at a time. Can I add a little bit more water? <laughs> I know some people who hardly ever drink any, any fluid. And I'm like, this is potentially why you don't feel very good. You're dehydrated. Like these things don't sound sexy. They don't sound flashy, but the rub is that they require some kind of real change in your life and some kind of consistency, something that you have to implement over time. And you may have quite frankly, some barriers to this. You have to figure out where's the barrier, where, why is this difficult to, to put into play? And so Robin mentioned eating breakfast. This is one of the number one things that I see with people that aren't feeling well is there, or they're like, I'm high on cortisol and I feel so unstoppable. And we're actually thinking, okay, well, your, 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 your hyper-focus is due to an elevation in stress hormones. So probably not the best situation, especially for people who are under a lot of other stress. When we take a look at something like breakfast, we might say, okay, start eating breakfast. But the reality is your morning schedule might be just really difficult. You might have kids to get off to school. Maybe you don't actually have any food prepared. I mean, where, where, where can we wiggle around those things to start getting a foothold? And so that's where you really need to take a step back and you go, I know the thing it's eating breakfast, for example, but what is standing in my way? Do I not know what to make for breakfast? Do I not know what to have on hand for breakfast? Is there, you know, am I, am I working out first thing in the morning? And so I'm not sure when to actually eat. Am I, do I have a really early work schedule? How can I have something prepared and ready to go? That's where the, the real change is going to have to happen is in that. And that's frankly, what a lot of times coaches are there for is to help you overcome identify the barriers, help you identify the resources. What are the skills you need to learn or put into practice? And what's the plan for actually doing that in a stepwise fashion? So again, I think there's a lot of stuff that we've covered here, but uh, suffice to say is like the better it sounds in terms of like, oh, this is going to be the one thing that's, that's the key. Um, You know, the more likely it is to just be a bunch of BS. Yes. Uh, I, I think what all of this comes down to is nuance and a willingness for things to take longer than you want them to. And a realization that, uh, this stuff is really mundane and basic, but basic and simple is not the same thing as easy. Uh, implementing basic things is really hard. There's a lot of barriers like so many barriers to implementing the quote unquote basic things. And then you have to keep doing it. And that's also really annoying. Like, cause we're humans. We like instant gratification. I'm the most impatient person I've ever met. So like, I, I, t- <laughs> so I totally feel people and it's like, yeah, there's something about the shiny new thing of being like, well, maybe this will be the one. Okay. This is exciting. And it's like, yeah, I, I totally get it. I, I think that I think that there, but I also think that there's ways to have a foundation for what you're doing and then find thoughtful ways to inject novelty into it. So you don't get bored, right? Like when we say protein, no one's saying you have to force feed yourself chicken, like (laughs) protein comes in more than one form, right? No one's saying you can't eat like quote unquote fun foods. I don't know. I don't, I wish we had better language for describing this stuff, right? Less nutrient dense food, but it, but it really just comes down to, I think, being realistic about where you are. And then also just being like, well, what I'm doing isn't working. So there's something going on here, whether it's 
the, the approach I'm taking, some other underlying issue I have. Maybe I'm like, there's, there's so many reasons why something can't be working. But I think step one is just sort of acknowledging like when we're not working and then just trying to find ways to ask for help or finding ways to be honest with ourselves. Like, yeah, am I actually consistently drinking water? Do I need more information on this? Or have I read so much about this that I'm now so confused and my brain is now so saturated with information from the internet and or PubMed, which is also really confusing sometimes that I now no longer know what to do. So as always, it depends. But I, to piggyback on what you both said, I think basic is a really good place to start, especially if that's not what you have done, which is usually not what we've done. And yeah, if it sounds really flashy and cool and great and amazing, um, that I'm fine with that being a Netflix promo trailer, but that's not real life. So like <laughs> real life fitness is just not that interesting. I'm so sorry. Uh, so with that, uh, if either of you have any parting thoughts, feel free to share them. And then again, so we don't talk over each other. We can kind of go one at a time. And then please just let people know if they want to work with you, connect with you, learn more about your work, find your podcast, all those things where people can find you. All right. Uh, parting thoughts. Well, um, to what you just said, and to and kind of piggybacking on Steph, you know, I think, I think I already mentioned we have this tendency to overcomplicate things for ourselves, and even when we're simplifying, it still feels really complicated sometimes. It's still like as Steph said, like how do I get breakfast into my day when when my morning is so busy, and so that's when a coach can come in and help remove these barriers for you because we have an ability to see things that you may not be able to see in your life. <laughs> and I, I have had this happen time and time again with clients. I've worked with clients on, you know, I have one client who, you know, she was struggling figuring out how to how to find time and energy to get her workouts in. And we realize that it's, she's struggling with sleep. Why is she struggling with sleep? Well, she says her husband likes to put on the TV at night. And she's like, I have a hard time falling asleep when my husband has the TV on, but he likes to have the TV on. I'm like, cool. How fast does he fall asleep? She's like, 10 minutes. I'm like, turn the TV off and go to bed. She couldn't think of that for herself. Like that's, we have so much stuff going on in our lives. It's like, I'm not knocking her. We have so much stuff going on in our lives that sometimes we can't see like really simple solutions. So sometimes that's when a coach can come in and help remove these barriers for you that you don't even know are there and clear a path for you to do these simple things and for them to feel simple. So if you are struggling, and I know, you know, we also have a tendency to want to find our own answers, go to YouTube or go to the influencers and like, I'm going to figure this out for myself. But sometimes when you invest in a coach, it can clear the path for you so much faster um, and get you to that place you want to be in a way that, that a lot of these, you know, wacky online solutions air quote solutions can't do. So just wanted to put that out there. I also like my big parting thought goes back to goals. And that's, you know, my overarching goal. Yes, I played roller derby for 11 years and that's not for everybody. Sure. I run obstacle races. I did three obstacle races at high elevation in one weekend and then ran a half marathon last weekend. I don't necessarily recommend that. Um, but anyway, like these are the things that light me up, but they're not necessarily the things that light everybody up, but they're also not my overarching goal. My overarching long-term fitness goal is I want my body to do whatever the heck I want it to do at any point in time for the rest of my life. That's my goal. That's the foundation is like, I want to be able to do, if I see something that's like, that looks cool, I want my body to be able to do it. So I have to be able to support my body through exercise, through nutrition, through recovery, through sleep. At currently at age 46, but going into my 50s, 60s, 70s, I want to be able to do whatever the heck I want to do. And I just wanted to put that out there because that's a goal anybody can have. Like that's, it's really just basic and fundamental is just have the freedom of movement to do what you want, do what you need to do in a given day and do what you want to do, do what lights you up. So uh, that's sort of my parting gift in regards to like goals. Um, because I think that can apply to anybody. So you can find out more about me. Uh, my website is my first and last name, robinleggett.com, R-O-B-I-N-L-E-G-A-T.com. That's where you can see information about me, what I do as a coach. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Robin Leggett. I keep it easy, first and last name only. And, um, and you can contact me through there as well. And then my podcast is called Seasoned Athlete. Uh, this has been my baby since 2017. And it's all about 
coaching, advice, inspiration, motivation, and interviews with athletes over 40. I have talked to about 100 athletes um, from a wide range of sports, from a wide range of backgrounds, from elites who have been doing it their whole lives to, you know, I talked to a 96-year-old woman who started running in her 60s. Um, And so it just proves that it's never too late to start something new. You don't have to be an elite to be an athlete. Um, you can define yourself as an athlete. If you're, if you move your body and, and enjoy it, you know, you're an athlete, guess what? Congratulations. So, um, there's a lot of great inspiration and motivation. And I do solo episodes as well, where I, you know, I do my own brand of coaching. And so lots of, you know, free educational content in that podcast as well. So it's seasoned athlete at seasoned athlete on Instagram or seasoned athlete dot me is the website, but you can listen to it on, you know, your favorite podcast player, go find it. Please listen. Thank you. I love it. Uh, okay. So some, some parting thoughts. Oh gosh. <laughs> How can it be succinct here? Um, the first thing I think is that if you are, uh, if you are approaching or in perimenopause or in menopause, um, I just want you to know that there, there are so many, the, the mark, like, mm, how do I want to say this? Uh, for so long, these phases of life have been shrouded in mystery. People haven't talked about them. We haven't had good quality information. And at the same time, now I feel like the pendulum is swinging the other way where you are being sold that there are some magical, mysterious things that you need to do in this phase of life. And certainly when you're not feeling well, and, and things feel like they're going wacky on you. There are things that can help that I have no ability to talk about. For example, hormone repa- replacement therapy. That's a conversation you should really be having with your doctor. Um, or you're figuring out some of the more mysterious symptoms that you may be feeling. So I, I do want to preface that and say, of course, there are, there are things that you may need help with that come from very qualified people. Um, and so please seek those out if, if you're not feeling well. And at the same time, the, uh, oh, this, this breaks my brain. So many of the other things that really will benefit you in this phase of life are the same things that you would do in any other phase of life, right? Eating, uh, and I'm going to say in air quotes here, eating, uh, you know, balanced, balanced meals, like nutrient dense foods, like all those things are the same. Like w- we wouldn't do that any differently in, in that phase of life, as opposed to any other phase of life lifting weights and getting stronger. It, it really looks pretty much the same. Well, there might be considerations there. Like if you're having vasomotor symptoms and you're having hot flashes in the middle of a workout, like, yes, you might respond a little bit differently based on how your body is actually feeling. So I think that currently what we're seeing is a lot of stuff is being marketed toward perimenopause, menopause. That just is, is like the same stuff that you would do or it's being sold as like, here's this miracle cure or this miracle thing, or this hormone balancing thing or whatever it is when that's not really a thing. So please consumer be wise, you know, take a look at stuff, like really ask questions, I guess, if you have doubts as to you're going to invest in a program or, or something, for example, that is marketed toward this, uh, this market, because what I see is a lot of predatory marketing because women in this age category tend to have more disposable income and are looking for solutions. I get it, right? You're not feeling well. You want to figure out what's going on. But at the same time, there's a lot of people taking advantage of that. So that's the one thing I would say. The other thing I would say is, you know, women, we're so capable. We're so capable beyond what we've been told our whole lives. And I feel like if you do want to get stronger, you do want to see what you're capable of doing. You do want to challenge yourself. There's no age limit to that. Just like Robin was saying. And, um, you know, so find, find someone that you can follow online. Like the three of us find someone that, that is uh, a friend who's on a similar trajectory that you have some companionship and someone who understands you find resources that are supportive of what you want to do, because there's also this narrative that once we turn 40, like we're frankly, like kind of, we're, we're just falling apart and it's too late. And I don't think that that's true at all. So find, find like-minded people in a community in your life, like who can encourage you and support you along the way, because 
you're not alone. There are lots of people who are like you, who are, are challenging the norms and are out there and saying, you know, I want to live a full second half of my life. I don't think that life is over at 40. If I want to challenge myself, I can do that. So that's just what I would add there. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm at Steph Godreau there. I am on stephgodreau.com as well. And my podcast is called the Listen to Your Body Podcast. It's been running since 2015. So we have over 350 episodes um, with with Nikki now and with Robin as well. So if you want to go listen to their episodes, you can. And I'm just really you know, fortunate to be able to have been sharing and, and working online now for over eight years. And it's been, it's been amazing. So I have programs there, lots of education, uh, a book called the core four. So if you want to get in kind of at any level and just see what I'm up to, um, you can do that. And I also have some coaching programs. I have a group strength nutrition program that opens uh, a few times a year. And I also do one-on-one strength nutrition coaching as well. So you can check that all out on my website. Yes. Well, thank you both for having, um, this conversation, I'm just kind of ending it on yes, because (laughs) otherwise we'll just keep going in circles forever. But, uh, I I appreciate you both being here and sort of digging into some of these things because it's broad, but it's also really specific to the pushback that I sort of keep experiencing and seeing from people. And I, I, you know, I'm not judging the pushback, but there is just there is just so much confusion and there is so much of to like Steph's point with like this menopause, perimenopause aging thing, where it's like, I see the narrative just go in two ways all the time. It's like, go into the light with chair yoga. And I'm not saying that chair yoga is bad, but like we need more than chair yoga. I'm sorry. We just do right. Like you're not Jerry. Like, even if you're in your eighties, you still need more than chair yoga. Unless like, that's truly just where your body is at for whatever reason. Or if you have a lot of health issues, that are compromising, right? I'm not trying to be ableist. I'm just saying like most of us are capable of more. So to tell us to do less is really, I think really damaging and actually is what causes a lot of sort of that deterioration that we associate with aging. That's not just aging. Um, Or it turns into like, again, these weird juice cleanse, um, special diet, elimination diet things with hormone balancing, which it it just did the the science just doesn't support it. The end on that one. I'm not going to go there right now. Plus I'm not an endocrinologist. I would leave that one to my father though. He probably wouldn't know what to say either because he's not on the internet much smarter than I am in that way. Um, so anyways, I appreciate you both being here. Uh, everyone, please just go check out their work, um, and their programs. They do amazing things and better information is out there. That's my final parting thought on this. So thank you all for listening. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Let me hit stop. And that's a wrap. Thanks so much for listening. If you haven't already done so, please consider leaving the show a rating and review over on iTunes. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Catch you on the next one.